A państwa i moim gościem jest Steve Bannon, a former chief of Donald Trump's presidential campaign and the White House chief strategist, successful kingmaker of the American right, former Hollywood producer, brilliant filmmaker and host of one of the most interesting and influential media projects worldwide, worldwide, a war room pandemic podcast which, reach, which reaches millions of viewers and listeners worldwide, many of them hidden behind the VPNs trying to lose a tale of Chinese secret services and the communist internet censorship machine. A host of War Room and always the rebel, Mr. Steve Bannon. Welcome back to Polish television. Thanks for having me, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Bannon, a couple of days ago, President Donald Trump said uh, the following words about the coronavirus pandemic. We went through uh, the worst attack than Pearl Harbor. This is worse than the World Trade Center. There's never been an attack like this, and it should never happen. Could have been stopped at the source, could have been stopped in China. What's your take on those words and reasons why Donald Trump decided to send those words, as you say, from the very the same desk, the resolute desk that the world, uh, that the words of Pearl Harbor and the World Trade Center were sent to the whole world years ago? You know, on the, uh, it's ironic, I'm here uh, speaking to a, a Polish audience on the 75th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. And American involvement in that began really in the Pacific with Pearl Harbor. And I think when President Trump actually said those words the other day from the Oval Office, from the exact desk that Franklin Roosevelt fought the Second World War, the entire world should take notice. Remember, there's three types of warfare today. There's information war, there's economic war, and there's kinetic, or war that you actually fight with weapons. And he said attack. I mean, he was very specific. He said an attack like Pearl Harbor or 9-11, and he said the complete responsibility of this is China's. And it could have been stopped and it never should have happened. I think that shows you the direction that the evidence is taking President Trump in finding culpability for this horrific event that has essentially, you know, killed what, over uh, over 200,000 people, I think, worldwide, killed almost uh, 80,000 people here in the United States alone, and caused uh, almost immeasurable economic damage, economic carnage, which would be felt in nations like Poland for at least a decade. So remember, when you don't have a, uh, when you have a job, when you have a job that's not paying you as much as you think you're worth, when you really don't have any assets or any pension fund, you're going to be able to blame the Chinese Communist Party. This is as serious as it gets. And I think every leader in the world and every citizen of the world should sit up and take notice when the commander in chief of the American military says we were attacked like Pearl Harbor. And it's the responsibility of one nation and one political party, which is the Chinese Communist Party. So is the Western world at war with China, or with Chinese Communist Party? The Chinese Communist Party has been at war with the West now for at least, I think, 10 years. Specifically since 2018, President Xi called on really a, a, a war against the West at the, uh, I think it was the 18th Communist Party. Uh, of information and economic war, and you're seeing that throughout Europe, uh, Eastern Europe today. And, and unfortunately, uh, our Russia, which could have potentially been an ally with the West, is now siding with uh, the communists in China, as is Turkey, as is uh, Iran or Persia, Pakistan, and North Korea to control the Eurasian landmass. Um, and I think we only have uh, very dark days ahead of us, very dark days ahead of us. But yes, yeah, certainly the Chinese Communist Party has been at, the, been at war with the West, information war and economic war for quite a while. And now I think it may be even devolving to a kinetic war. Uh, we will move to the proofs in a minute, but before we do that, you are one of the first, uh, or actually the first in the Western world who raised the questions of Wuhan lab role in the COVID-19 outbreak. It was months ago. Today, your viewpoint is an official viewpoint, not only of the United States, but Great Britain, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, as we found out from the famous Five Eye intelligence report that was published in Australia a couple of uh, weeks ago. So, what are the proofs? Can you walk us through the available data pointing out the role of the Wuhan lab uh, in this uh, whole terrific outbreak? 
Well, remember, let's let's put responsibility in the Chinese Communist Party. Let's leave the lab and the bioweapons program to the side just for a second. Let's talk about responsibility. The Chinese Communist Party knew that they had human to human transmission and community spread in Wuhan on a SARS like virus the last week of December. We know that because of Dr. Lee, the great martyr of Wuhan, who informed everybody. And they suppressed him, tortured him, and got him to sign a, a document that basically said he was a rumor monger. We also know that the uh, Taiwanese, the Free Republic of China in Taiwan, notified the World Health Organization on the 31st of December of 2019. So the last week in December, the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing knew that there was human to human transmission and community spread of this virus. President uh, Xi himself says that on the 7th of January, he took direct control of Wuhan. The whole contingent came here to the United States, whole contingent went to Davos, never said a word. We do know by their actions, they shut down Lunar New Year around the 18th of January, knowing they had human to human transmission in Wuhan and in Ube province. They shut down, which every year is the largest uh, migration of, of, of people in history, 500 million people in China go back home. They stopped that. They shut the Forbidden City. They shut Shanghai, Disneyland. They shut the Great Wall. They wouldn't let any travel inside of, uh, inside of China. They also, at the same time, simultaneously, from being a net, a net exporter of personal protective equipment, which protects the doctors and nurses, the key thing, they became an importer. They vacuumed up all of Europe, all of the United States, all of Australia, and all of Brazil, of all that equipment. Knowing they had this outbreak, they stopped domestic travel but let people travel internationally, particularly to Europe and the United States. That's how this got transmitted to, to Italy and up from Italy all the way up through uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and then to, through JFK to the United States. This was the equivalent of premeditated murder. Every person, every doctor and nurse that died, every person that died holds the Chinese Communist Party directly responsible for their death. These people know it. Now, that's leaving aside the labs. And we know already in the labs they were running experiments they never should have been running. They had very little management of that. In fact, the infamous bat lady or bat woman who oversaw these very dangerous, uh, very dangerous experiment, experiments is quoted in Scientific American in March from a quote she gave when she was notified by the hospital that they had patients there that had a SARS-like virus. The first thing out of her mouth, she goes, I hope this didn't come from the experiments that were running. So we know that the world's intelligence services, the world's medical services, public health are doing massive investigations now focused on the P4 lab in Wuhan. Remember, I don't believe in the deep state. I do not believe in conspiracy theories, but I also don't believe in coincidences. The whole situation with the wet market is a complete misdirection play by the Chinese Communist Party. And I don't have to tell people in Poland who know the lies and misrepresentations that a communist dictatorship will say and tell. And so it's quite evident that something very suspicious that went on in that laboratory, better minds than mine, uh, better uh, smarter people in the intelligence services are investigating this right now, but every trend is coming towards the fact that something happened in that lab and somehow a biological Chernobyl uh, was created. And just like the Soviets in Chernobyl didn't care what happened to the local people around Chernobyl and didn't care what happened to the people in Kiev and didn't care what happened to the people in Warsaw with the, with the cloud of radioactivity, radio ma material. So... The dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing did not care. In so this fact, is, in your opinion, this is a similar virus cloud that is traveling around the world like the radioactive cloud from Chernobyl years ago? Yes, absolutely. In fact, it's even worse than that. It's a pretty a building body of evidence that when they knew that they had an outbreak and they locked down Ube province, which is the size of France, and they locked down Wuhan, which is 40% bigger than New York City, in a hard quarantine. They stopped all domestic travel inside of China, but they allowed international travel. And they swept up all the personal protective equipment at the same time. They actually exacerbated the spread of the virus throughout the world because they didn't care. They said, hey, if we're going to have it, 
let the world have it. These are gangsters. Just like Poland was ruled by these gangsters for decades after the uh, World War II. And the Polish people know exactly how communists, uh, how communists uh, treat people, what communists think of people, and how they how they care, they could care less about a nation, they could care less about its people. That's why the first victims of this were the Chinese people in Wuhan. But the second victims were, were all of mankind, starting in Europe and then the United States. Okay, staying with the, with the, with the question of the proofs, we have also a very, uh, very important quote from Mike Pompeo, who's the Secretary of State, but is a former uh, director of the CIA. He's also talking about the proofs that the United States uh, got regarding the Chinese role in this whole outbreak, and I assume Chinese Communist Party responsibility. Yeah, Mike Pompeo is, is, is actually a former head of CIA, West Point graduate on the House Intelligence Committee, has a long track record in intelligence. He's kind of leading the effort, one of the, the senior members of the Trump administration leading the effort to pull this together, but he's very blunt. Today was even more blunt that he said, quote, we know it came from Wuhan, right? I, I don't think there's any question now that as the intelligence agency gather up information and prove that places like the World Health Organization, remember, the World Health Organization is a, an accomplice to this. And Tedros, who's from the Mao Party uh, in, uh, in East Africa, where he's from, and has been an a, a individual, it's always kowtowed to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, the World Health Organization, on the 12th of January, when the Chinese Communist Party knew they had human-to-human -human transmission and community spread, they actually lied. They put, out a, they put out a press release that said, oh, senior Chinese medical officials tell us there's no human-to-human -human transmission. Then on the 14th, they tweeted out the exact same information and led the world. They fought President Trump when President Trump tried to stop air traffic coming in from, from China. I mean, ask the people in Milan. If the people in Milan could do it over again, or the people in London could do it over again, they certainly would have stopped air traffic. If people had stopped air traffic from China, this, uh, this uh, a pandemic would have been much less. Remember, the University of Southampton in England has done a very in-depth analysis. And they said, if the Chinese Communist Party had acted in the last week of December or the first week of January, 95% of the deaths, 95% of the agony, 95% of the economic carnage would have never have happened. They would have been able to lock it down in Wuhan itself. They did not do that because they didn't want to show the world what was happening in that lab. And then when they knew it was out of control, they just said, heck with it. Let it spread all over the world. They are totally 100% culpable for every death, for all the agony, and for all the economic carnage. And now it's incumbent from the nations of the world to unite to go get reparations. We will talk about the uh, money also in a minute because it looks like a major point in this whole discussion. But what do we know about the disease in the first place, as, as for now. We've heard on your show about the Pentagon official paper claiming that the history of COVID-19 disqualifies, uh, disqualifies candidates to the American army. And it seems to me that it contradicts the official information that people who suffered from this disease gained the immunity. What's your take on this? My take is that we know very little about this disease. This is very complicated. For your audience, please remember, besides all the happy talk you're hearing, there's no vaccine for SARS-1, right? There's no vaccine for HIV. There's no vaccine for MERS. These are enormously complicated viruses. And this virus is much more complicated, as my understanding, than, than SARS-1. Remember, the official name of this is SARS-2. This is a SARS-like virus. We know very, very little about this virus. Here's one thing we know. The United States military, and the Polish people know this from the Cold War and from the Second World War, were pretty good about how you process human beings into a military situation. The United States military came out on Thursday and said, having this virus or having had this virus permanently disqualifies you, permanently disqualifies you from medical, uh, from a military service in the United States. That is a stunning, stunning revelation. And we're just trying to get to the bottom of it now. Remember, the American military needs people. You know, one of the biggest and most active militaries throughout the entire world, if not the world. And it's pretty stunning to know this permanently disqualifies you. 
So people are trying to get someone. People give you happy talk. Just point to the American military. And remember, the American military has the most advanced bioweapons defense program in the world. So if you want to know about people who know something about biological agents, viruses, biological weapons, it's the United States Army. And for the United States military to come out and make a statement like that and basically say, if you've had it, don't even come. Not like, give us your number, we'll call you in six months when you feel better. It's pretty stunning. And I think people in the world ought to wake up to the fact of, what do we really know about this virus? And what do we know about it coming to my community? And I would tell people right now, don't believe any happy talk about a vaccine. Don't believe any happy talk about therapeutics. It all may come. You have the best minds in the world working on this. You have more money that's ever been put into a program like a Manhattan-type project. But for right now, this virus is very complicated. It mutates all the time. Uh, it's had different reactions in different parts of the world. Uh, and all I say is that, hey, listen to the experts. Obviously, you know, weigh and measure what they say. But I think right now we know very little about this, as shown by some of the actions that are taken by institutions that are dependent upon manpower. Yeah, those uh, and this is official Pentagon paper, which is which is stunning and very puzzling. I uh, I think, uh, Mr. Bannon, you said in your show a couple of times that only three numbers matter in all this situation: uh, the number of deaths, number of jobless people, and the amount of U.S. dollars China owes to the for the Corona outbreak to the to the Western world. You are actually talking about U.S., but from my perspective, from our perspective, the whole Western world uh, is on the receiving part of uh, on the receiving end of this uh, of this virus. Those first two numbers are obvious, but why do you focus on the third uh, one? We may talk about the hundreds of trillions of dollars. Why do you think so? I think that to, to basically have a set of metrics on how to think about this, remember, you have a bunch of things happening at the same time as what we try to cover on the show. You have a pandemic of a virus that's never been seen before in human history. On top of that, you have an economic uh, crisis that's triggered. That's an economic crisis of a collapse in uh, aggregate demand and maybe the destruction of aggregate demand, right, caused by this, but you also have a deeper issue about supply chains. To supply chains from everything like the medical equipment to the deeper issue of supply chains of industrial products and consumer goods. On top of that, that triggered a world financial crisis. You have a world financial crisis of liquidity and solvency, of whether we were going to have capital markets of bonds and equity, or these companies and these markets will all collapse. And that is in the, in the framework of a geopolitical context. And so to try to just get, put it down to something simple that people can think about every day in metrics. There are three numbers to me that encapsulate everything you ought to think about. The deaths, right? And the death rate in the United States, remember, the president today just said, hey, guess what? I think it's going to be 110,000. Well, last Friday, he, we were at 60,000. We've essentially doubled the official count on the low end by 100%. We're over 100,000 dead now, projected. We happen to believe that we'll be, a, if you look at the numbers, because we're losing about 2,000 people a day here in the United States, we'll be over... 100,000 by the end of May, by Memorial Day. So that'll blow through that number. The other is the number of jobless. We're right now at a greater number, percentage-wise, in the Great Depression. We've had 33 million people lose their jobs in the last six, seven, eight weeks. Plus, that's unemployed. The other concept is underemployed. That means if you had a full-time job and maybe you're only working half-time now or they're going to cut your pay in half, the underemployment's going to be a huge issue. So this is This is an economic inferno, okay, that's on fire, just burning, out of control. And then you can basically, I think, impute from those the basic, the number, the cash number that the Chinese Communist Party owes the entire world, that they owe every nation, right, for the dead and for the economic carnage. It's on Beijing. Beijing, the bill's got to be sent to Beijing, and we have to enforce the payment of it. Because every dead person in Poland, in all the economic carnage, no one in Poland had anything to do with. You are completely and totally innocent, just like the victims in Wuhan, just like the victims in Ubay. The people that caused this are the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, and they've got to be held accountable. And I happen to think this number now is conservatively going to be in the tens of trillions of dollars. You hit 
by saying those words and those uh, claims, you hit the very base of the, uh, of the communist uh, regime because it is uh, founded, it is built on the money that, uh, as in the United States you say, deplorables of the Western world, world, but also taxpayers' money from USA, Poland and many other countries are being sent over to China for over 30 years. And this money is a secret of today's position of the last powerful communist regime uh, on earth. Yes, you listen, the, the polls don't need me to tell them, but if you just think back, the way that the communists stripped all the value, all the value of your labor, all the value of your country, and took it for themselves. Now, just like... Uh, the communists too. The Chinese communists are even better at getting the money out of their country. So if you go to London, one of the reasons the real estate prices are so high, the Chinese Communist Party has bought much of central London and Belgravia and all these fancy neighborhoods. Because remember, these aren't really communists. That's just a title they use. This is just another totalitarian dictatorship. The people in China are treated like slave labor. Folks in Poland, understand this about how your labor is never valued fully that all the all the value creation from your labor is stripped out by the apparatus and taken to a very few number of people that's just the way they run this remember they're just a group of gangsters they don't believe in the rule of law they don't believe in human dignity they don't believe in freedom or individual rights they don't believe in democracy they don't believe in any of that they believe in the law of power in money in materialism completely atheistic they don't believe in not just Christianity, they don't believe in any religion. They, they torment and have tortured uh, the Tibetan Buddhists and the Dalai Lama, East Turkestan, the Uyghurs, the Muslims in, in, in East Turkestan, right? The, the Falun Gong, another spiritual Buddhist movement, the underground house Christians, the underground Catholic Church, live organ harvesting. This is just a group of bloodthirsty gangsters. So Great. is there anywhere... They, the people that get the biggest victims are the Chinese people. They've stripped all that wealth They've taken all the factories in the West. They have a slave labor camp essentially in China. They're nothing but slave laborers. And they've made serfs of everybody else because all they export is overcapacity and deflation. And that's why workers of the world can't get paid real wages. We must unite to break the Chinese Communist Party. But do we have tools to do this? To do this? How the Western world can make the Chinese Communists accountable for what happened? Do we have tools? We have the greatest tool ever. It's the spirit and the will of free men and women. Did we have, did it look pretty dark at the beginning of us fighting the Nazis and the fascists in, in the late 1930s and 1940s? Did it look pretty dark after Pearl Harbor, after we were attacked by the Imperial Japanese military? Did it look pretty dark in many of the days of the Cold War? Did it look dark in the, in the, around Berlin and the, and the Cuban Missile Crisis? But human spirit, here's the tool we got, is the heart, soul, and spirit of free men and women. And Poland showed us that. We would have never taken down the Soviet Union if it was not for Ronald Reagan and the Polish people, and Pope John Paul II and Margaret Thatcher. So we got the greatest tools ever been invented. The spirit and the fight and the indefatigability of free men and women. So that's the tool we're using. Look, we'll use a lot of, you know, legal courts and and uh, and other information warfare and economic warfare and eventually kinetic warfare. If that's where they want to go, that's where they want to go. But we're not going to lose this. We just have to say we have to stand up just like we should have stood up to Hitler earlier, just like we should have stood up to Mussolini earlier, just like we should have stood up to the dictators in Moscow. It, it's very interesting that you, that you mentioned uh, Moscow because less uh, than two days after President's, uh, uh, President Trump's words about Pearl Harbor and World Trade Center, we got a, a tricky answer, I think, from the very center of the Communist Secret Services intelligence world. Because uh, as we read in the quote from TASS, Russian uh, agency cable, uh, on the Russian Chinese teleconference, citing the director of foreign uh, intelligence service of Russia, Sergei Narishkin, who said something like this, Russia and China consistently adhere to the principles of the international solidarity and reject any attempts to use the pandemic to settle political accounts uh, it, uh, and the title of this cable was Russia and China against 
attempt to use a pandemic to settle political accounts. Again, what's your take on this? Russia and Chinese communist uh, uh, secret services uh, together uh, are sending this kind of message after Donald Trump's message. What does it mean? Look, I, I have been a big advocate that we should try, we should have tried and, and done a better effort of trying to pull the Russians into an alliance with the Judeo-Christian West, India, the industrial democracies of, of, of South Korea and Japan for a global alliance against the Chinese Communist Party. And obviously, things that have happened over the last couple of years, that didn't come to fruition. And that I think the Russians are actively working with uh, Beijing, just like Tehran is. You know, it's, the, it's, it's Persia, Turkey, Russia, Pakistan, and North Korea are working in an informal alliance to control the Eurasian landmass. And we know how that turns out. Right. This is going to be a long, tough struggle. The whole issue of Russia working with Saudi Arabia to destroy the U.S. oil and gas market. They took a gangster hit on us. They, they've gone a long way to destroying our fracking industry. This is all right now. Their number one objective is to get off the U.S. dollar as the prime reserve currency. That's what their big focus is, using gold backed cyber currencies, using oil backed securities. They're trying to get off the dollar because they they feel the West has a chokehold on them as long as they have to convert everything into dollars. So this is an ongoing, I mean, look, this information and economic war has been, I think, a hot war driven by the Chinese Communist Party for many, many years. And now it's just coming up to the, to the surface when you see this, what happened this pandemic. But everything you need to know about the Russians working the Chinese is in that cable right there, in that, in that joint announcement. And the Russians should understand something. We're not settling scores. We're trying to get justice for the world. And if they think they're going to stand in the way of that, I got, I got news for them. They're, they're, a, they're a declining power, a rapidly declining power. Okay, I realize they got their arrogance and they, got their, they want to be a great power. They're not a great power. They're not a great economic power. They're not really a great military power. They're not a great diplomatic power. And if the Russians choose to side with the Chinese Communist Party, then they're going to share the fate of the Chinese Communist Party. And I will guarantee you this, free men and women throughout the world binding together is going to put the Chinese Communist Party in the dustbin of history, just like it put the Nazis and the fascists in World War II. When we last time talked on uh, Minewa Dwudzesta on our evening show in um, uh, TV, uh, TVP, you said that the coronavirus, and it was in late January, as I remember, you, you said that the coronavirus is the single most important case that is developing uh, worldwide over there, and right now as well. Back in January, we've heard in your show that by the May, the numbers of victims in the United States will be counted in tens of thousands. And this is reality today. Donald Trump, as you mentioned, is talking about 110,000 victims in, you, in the United States uh, only. Can you comment on that? How did you know? How did you know that, the, that those numbers will look that way? And how did you know that this thing will be a global issue no matter what we do? You know, in the late, mid to late 70s, I went to China the first time as a naval officer in the Seventh Fleet, the Pacific Fleet, on a destroyer in the United States Navy, and that's where I became acquainted with China. And you know, I've got a great love for the Chinese people and a deep love for China as a nation, China as a people and as a country. So I've been in and out of China for what forty some years. I know China fairly well. And when I saw what was happening on Lunar New Year in mid-January, and I saw what they were doing in shutting down a, a province that's the size of France in the biggest lockdown in human history, and quarantining, a hard quarantine, on a city that's 40% bigger than New York City, and understanding how the communist regime only exists because they provide economic power, economic goods for their people, and they were prepared to lock that down, I said, look, this is going to be a world historical event. The Chinese Communist Party does not do that unless they fully understand how huge this is, how, how lethal and deadly this pandemic is, this virus. And so it was fairly easy to extrapolate what would happen to the countries of the world because you could kind of see it coming. And so we have been ahead of the story. But the reason is, look, I don't know anything about pandemics, 
What I do know is how the Chinese Communist Party reacts. And I can tell, given the scale uh, of their shutdown in China and the fear it induced in their leadership that this was going to be world historical. And I will tell you right now, I think we're still day by day trying to feel this out. We've got a long way to go on this pandemic, and we have a very long way to go on the economic carnage. People in Poland should understand right now the most sophisticated people at the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank in the United States of America, are talking about it could be a very long time before the economy comes back. And the chief economist, I think, for J.P. Morgan Bank last night said it could be a decade, 10 to 12 years before we ever get the unemployment, the employment numbers back. And so for the entire Western world and India and Japan, we now are in a sense really in a mini Great Depression brought to you by the Chinese Communist Party. So this is only at the very beginning stages. Don't think at all that this thing is passed. Okay, but we are getting to the to, to, to the our, our time is uh, is uh, is running down. But let me ask you just two more questions, uh, and let me begin the the, the this one with uh, some quotes uh, uh, from Chinese uh, propaganda attacks on you from last week. You know those quotes very well, but our viewers probably not. So this is from the Chinese state uh, TV. The American people should see clearly that an extremist like Bannon would lead them amiss and would have them march to the wrong beat. This is one. And another one is about you saying that the Chinese Communist Party will have to pay tens of trillions of dollars. Bannon, an obstinate and anti-China activist, gives words of nonsense, forcibly dumping charges to China with no moral integrity. There are lots of propaganda shots like this that are being fired at you. Why did you become the Chinese propaganda target number one? Well, I'm public enemy number one for the Chinese Communist Party, and they just let off their, their national news broadcast the other day with a personal attack on me, and here's why. They're nervous. They realize that I'm speaking to the Chinese people. Remember, I broadcast into China through the firewall to the Chinese people. This is why I knew about the, the pandemic so early, is our relationship and, and, you, and working with dissidents outside of China to get the word back to Lao Beijing, which is the, the term for the common man, old hundred names, because there's about a hundred last names in China. And so old hundred names is very much what the Trump deplorables are. They're working class people, middle class people that believe in their families and hard work and just want to be left alone and get a, and so they can get ahead in the world uh, by themselves. These people are very have very, I think, common values to people in the United States and people in Poland, just hard working, you know, tough people. And so I have spent you know, many years building a relationship with them. And I put the blame on the Chinese Communist Party. Remember, the biggest victims of the Chinese Communist Party are the Chinese people, just like the biggest victims of the Communist Party in Russia and the biggest victims of the Communist Party in Poland were the Polish people. You've lived this history, you know what they're going through. And so I have struck a chord and I'm relentless about putting them in the spotlight for blame and they're nervous and they attack me 24 seven. It doesn't matter. I, this is my life's work. I'm, 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 I'm a populist and I'm an economic nationalist. And this gets to the heart of populism. It gets to the heart of economic nationalism. And the, whoever assists the Chinese people in their freedom, and they will be free. Whoever assists them in their freedom will help write the history of the 21st century. Well, we have the history of listening to the free world while we were the victims of the Polish and Russian communists. Uh, so the radio show, the podcast that you are doing right now is playing exactly the same role in China. That's my final question. We are talking on the, as you started our conversation with that, on the day of the 75th anniversary of the Allies' victory in the World War II. But uh, it was a bitter moment in the history of Poland and half of Europe. We were left behind the Communist Iron Curtain. In your two-day episode in, at, at War Room Pandemic, you referred to a famous uh, Churchill's quote by saying, and those are your words, our work from the 20th century is still not done yet. The original words of uh, Churchill were spoken on the day of the Second World War ended. But do you find the communist China problem an unfinished business of the Cold War? Yes, I think, I think that we can now look at the Chinese Communist Party as the unfinished work of the 20th century. 
that we allowed one dictatorship to remain. Uh, we found out, you know, what well, how what happened when we got rid of the communists in Eastern Europe and allowed Eastern Europe to now flourish and and, and be uh, and be free men and women, right? That can stand on their own, have their own democracies, have their own debates. Everything's not going to go perfectly, as as you guys know, but at least you've got freedom. And so I think that this is the unfinished work of the of the 20th century. And the, like I said. Whoever assists the Chinese people, whoever assists Lao Beijing, old hundred names, in gaining his and her freedom will write the, the history of the 21st century. But we have got to assign this dictatorship to the dustbin of history, just like we did the Soviet communists, just like we did the fascists, just like we did the Nazis, and just like we did the imperial Japanese uh, military. We have to do that. That's our, that's our, that's our calling. That's our dharma. That's our destiny. And so whoever I think will work to assist the Chinese people uh, will be on the right side of history. And that sunlit uplands will be ahead of us as soon as the Chinese Communist Party is broken. Stephen K. Bannon, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this uh, conversation. See you at War Room Pandemic. You can find it online easily just by uh, putting it on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, See you next time. So we are uh, looking forward for, for our next conversation in Kabul. Great honor. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you very much.